you. Thank you. Good morning. I also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting workshop and for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of my work. So I work on uh, combinatorial models, simple but uh, still hopefully meaningful combinatorial models for problems in computational biology. And today I will in particular talk about models for computing network modules. So in uh, network biology, the goal is to understand the physical and uh, the functional architecture of the cell in terms of abstract network models. And then, of course, to exploit this knowledge in terms of uh, finding new drug targets, uh, improving methods for classification, etc. And this is a very ambitious goal. As we all know, the cell is very complex. But luckily, um, the cell is organized uh, in terms of modules. So these are sort of more or less well-defined functional building blocks that help the, carry, uh, the cell carry out its function. And therefore, it's a meaningful task at the network level also to look for these network modules. And in this talk, I will consider a module as a connected subnetwork in some larger biological interaction network. And um, I will present models and algorithms for finding these modules in two scenarios, basically. One, if there's only network data available, and the other one, if there's network data and additional data we can use um, to find uh, basically active regions, giving that data in the network. And I assume in this talk that this data is given in the form of p-values, which is often the case in uh, biological experiments. So the talk is roughly structured along this uh, schema. So um, this axis here denotes the number of networks. So we can have one network and do something, or we can have two or more networks. And then um, on top of this axis, these are network-only approaches, and uh, below, this is the, when you have additional data at hand. So if you only have one network and nothing else, then you can still look for modules in terms of topological structures within this network, for example, clustering the network, looking for complexes. And I've also done some work here um, on, on cluster editing, a nice model, but I, I don't have the time to speak about this today. If you have two or more networks, then you can identify modules by comparing similar structures between these two networks, maybe from different species or strains. And uh, you can do this by network alignment, and this way you can find conserved modules. And I will present my work on this part shortly after this. If you do have additional data, uh, then you can look for active modules, given that data. And you can combine this if you have additional data and multiple networks. You can even look for conserved active modules. Very likely, I will not have the time to go into our work on this topic. Okay. So the first part is a simple model for uh, conserved modules, so our work on global pairwise network alignment. And uh, so this is uh, somewhat older work. It started in 2008, 2009. And then, um, with the help of my former PhD student, Mohammed Al Kabir, we improved this in the last years. So here's the model. Um, so I focus on pairwise restricted global network alignment. So I call this restricted or sparse. And that's really the key word here in this title. What do I mean? This means that for a given node in one network, I'm only allowed to map it to a subset of other nodes in the other network. And this is a big uh, restriction, of course, but it makes often sense. So uh, many times we have given these relations in terms of uh, orthology databases. So we know something about the nodes we want to map to. And <coughs> sorry, in this case, we can, uh, we can exploit this. And in this case, this model will work. If we allow a node to go to any other node in the network, this model is not good. OK, but what is it actually? So the input is uh, to networks, um, G1 and G2. And I have two um, scoring functions, one C for mapping nodes onto each other, and one W for mapping pairs of nodes onto each other. So this is a very common scoring function in network alignment. And then I can define an alignment, network alignment, as a partial injective function, A, that goes from the first uh, graph to the other graph, the node sets, with the score S, which is basically the sum of the nodes that are, node scores that are mapped to each other plus 
the sum of the node pairs that are mapped to each other. So as I said, I look at the restricted case. So in this case, this, um, this value CIK, sorry, where is it here? So this will be minus infinity for most of the node pairs. And then uh, we have a restricted instance. Yes, please. Are the node pairs just as counted by edges or arbitrary node pairs? In this definition, uh, uh, this is arbitrary, but what I'm going to use later is indeed uh, this function w will have will be, for example, one if I have an edge between a pair of nodes here and an edge between a pair of nodes here. But you can use it for that case, but it is more general. Okay, and then of course the goal, it's a combinatorial optimization problem, is to find the best alignment, one best alignment in this scenario. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, if you look at this problem, then you maybe realize that this is uh, close to something which is very well studied for, for many, many years. A very nice problem, which is called quadratic assignment. And this is a facility location problem. So in quadratic assignment, the input is a set of facilities and a set of locations. And we have a flow between the facilities. So this is given in this matrix. It does not have to be symmetric. For example, we have 1.5 uh, things going from green facility to red. And from red to green, we have 1.3 and so forth. And then we have a distance matrix, so we want to place the facilities on some locations, and there's distances between these locations. So what's the problem now? Well, the problem is to find a bijection, so we really have to place um, each uh, facility somewhere, um, such as to minimize the scoring function. And this scoring function, again, has pairwise terms. <coughs> so if I look at a pair, <coughs> So basically, it's the sum over the products of uh, distances times the flows of the facilities assigned to these distances. So in essence, you want to put facilities that ha exchange a lot of flow close to each other. So here's a little example for the scoring function. If I just look at this pair, the green and the red facility, they're placed on the yellow and the blue spot. So the distance between the yellow and the blue spot is uh, 1.2, okay? And the flow I exchange uh, between uh, red and green is 1.5, and green and red is 1.3. Uh, so I sum this up, and this is, these are two of these terms in this objective function. And the overall aim is to minimize, um, to find an assignment that minimizes this function. And so the nice thing about this problem is that it is well studied. Of course, it is hard. Uh, it's a hard problem. It's also hard to approximate. Um, but there's a nice model for it, a nice integer programming model. And this uh, goes back to Gene Lawler, who was a professor here at Berkeley and also one of the founding fathers of the field of uh, combinatorial optimization. And you can see this, this is from 63. So this formulation has been around for a while, but it's still very useful. So how does it work? Well, we have an integer variable x. IK, it's a binary variable. It is one if we uh, place facility I on location K, okay? And then <coughs> the objective function um, just uh, models uh, the, the, the objective function from quadratic assignment. If we put I to K and J to L, then we count this term W I K J L, which is defined just as the product of the flow times the distance, okay? And then the constraints are such that uh, we have a bijective function and assignment. And uh, so this is a nice model. Of course, it's, uh, it's still a quadratic model. So we have to do something. It's not going to be so easy to solve this. But at this level, it's very nice to see that this is very related to network alignment, because I can put a network alignment model here, which is uh, very heavily inspired from this. So it's almost the same but not quite. So we have some differences which are highlighted in red here. So first of all, we don't minimize, we maximize, but this is not a real difference. So it's just uh, the same, basically. Then we have an additional linear term in the objective function. Again, this is, not a, this is not a problem. Then our matrix is symmetric in network alignment, which is just nice. We can forget about half the variables, but it's, again, not dramatic. Then we don't have in assignment, we have a matching, so we have a partial injective function. So we just have uh, less than or equals here instead of equalities. But that's the major difference. But the big, <coughs> excuse me, the, the big difference is really hidden. And this is, uh, well, my W matrix is sparse. 
because I use uh, the restricted input, and only then will it work nicely, this model. So the quadratic assignment problem is considered a very hard problem. Even for hard problems, it's one of, one of the hard ones. So instances with uh, 30 facilities or so are considered hard to solve, whereas I claim or I will show that I can solve this for in the restricted case for large, uh, for large networks, so it just works nicely. And the reason is that I really only look at a subset of nodes I can map one node to. So this is essential here. Okay, so how do we solve it again? We uh, build upon nice work of other people. There is a Lagrangian relaxation approach for the quadratic assignment problem, which is due to Adams and Johnson from the year 94. And the way it works is, well, you have this product of binary variables. You can linearize it, so you introduce new variables, y, and uh, this models the product, and then you split this variable in two copies. So this technique is called variable splitting. So you have two copies of y, and you add an inequality, and you enforce that these copies have to be the same. And then you can take this inequality equality, and relax it. So you dualize it, put it to the objective function, and penalize the violation with the Lagrangian term. And then you apply Lagrangian relaxation by iterating and solving these relaxed problems. And the relaxed problem is uh, in both cases. So this works uh, on the left, this works on the right. This is uh, here, it's just assignment problems, a bunch of assignment problems you have to solve. Here it's a bunch of uh, bipartite matching problems you have to solve. But uh, so this way you can solve these problems. So we implemented this uh, a while ago. And at the time, in our first paper, I compared it to the state of the art. And our method, which is called Natalie, um, uh, did very well. And, and recently, I wanted to update this. So I took one uh, more recent uh, alignment tool, which is LGRAL. Um, and uh, this, again, last year was published last year and has been shown to perform well against uh, the, within the state of the art. So now I compared the, our method against LGRAL. And I took uh, six networks from String, and I did uh, all against all comparisons. So these are fairly large networks. And uh, here are the results. So you can see, so these are the comparisons on this axis. So these are uh, worm, uh, fly, uh, rat, mouse, and human networks. And um, <clears throat> so we compare two things. So one is the symmetric substructure score, which is a recently introduced nice way to evaluate the quality of alignment. So it's one if they're ex uh, both uh, aligned perfectly. Uh, I don't go into the details here. And here you can see that uh, Natalie does uh, better than Elgual, especially on the large networks. And uh, also the other measure is the largest connected shared component, which is basically the size of the alignment. So here you can see that the methods are roughly the same. One nice uh, thing I noticed when running these experiments is that, so these networks are really large. So Yeast had uh, 150,000 edges or so, and uh, many, many thousands of nodes. But still, you can see with Lagrangian relaxation, you get up and lower bounds as you optimize. And of course, you hope that these uh, converge. And here, this worked very well. So we get almost perfect convergence. So we can show that all these instances can be solved within one or two percent optimal, and I should tell you maybe what the scoring function is I used. Indeed, I did the, I, I optimized the edge uh, conservation, which is just my, my W matrix will have a one if I have an edge in one network and an edge in the other network, and then I maximize the number of shared edges, and this worked very well in this case. Okay, so the next topic I want to speak about, this is now if you do have additional data at hand, and this is uh, a simple model for active models, uh, modules. Sorry, And this is joint work with uh, people from Würzburg. We started this also a while ago in 2007. And um, <clears throat> well, how does it work? Um, so if we have additionally measurements on the cell, which tell us something about what's going on in the cell, like, um, for example, differential, differential expression data, or GWAS, or proteomics data, or metagenomics data, and in this case, I, here I assume this comes in the form of p-values, then of course you can look at the data, you can order the p-values, and you can uh, derive hypotheses. But you can also look at the data in the context of a network, of an interaction network, protein interaction network, or other networks. And, this, and then you can look for active regions given that data in the network. And this idea, so the first paper I know, is uh, a paper by Trey Eidecker and colleagues from 2002. 
So roughly defined, an active module is a subset of connected, uh, well, a subset of genes that induce a connected uh, subnetwork in the network and shows strong signal in the data. And this last part, it's a matter of how you want to model this. So basically, you want your active module to have uh, lower p-values than expected by chance, but there's different ways of modeling this. And our way is as follows. So here we follow an approach by Pounds and Morris in 2003. So you can look at the density histogram of the p-values. So it's a data-driven approach. And you can model this. So here's a, here's the distribution from some real data set. You can model this as a mixture of a signal and a noise component. And you can say that the signal follows a beta distribution, the noise is uniformly distribution. And then the, um, by this, you can fit the parameters to this beta uniform mixture model. And you can derive a nice log likelihood ratio score for the activity of one node, which is just the logarithm of the signal over the noise. And what's even nicer in this model from Pounds and Morris, you can work in the FDR. So given a false discovery rate, this translates into a threshold p-value tau, such that genes or nodes with lower p-value will have a positive score. And uh, at tau, you get a score of 0. And uh, genes in this part, noise genes, will get a negative score. So if we now sum up the scores of genes or nodes of a module, we get a score of a module. And under the assumption that the p-values are independent, this is a log uh, likelihood ratio score for a whole module. And then it makes sense to look for the um, maximum likelihood module, which converts to finding a subset of nodes that induce a connected subgraph and maximize this function, so which is just the sum of these things. And it's a linear function. So the problem we look at here is, again, a nice combinatorial optimization problem. This is called maximum weight connected subgraph. And it's as follows. So input is a graph and this activity function, which tells you something about the activity of the nodes. Then just to find what I just described, a subset of nodes that induces um, a connected subgraph and such that the score is maximum. And again, there's a very similar problem around which has been studied, uh, oops, wrong key, sorry, which has been studied intensively. And this is the price collecting Steiner tree problem. So if you look at this, it's almost the same. So given a graph, now we have node profits and edge costs. The task is to find this connected subgraph. But now the score is the sum of the node profits minus the sum of the edge costs. And well, it's easy to see, or we could show that these problems are basically the same. So if you can do one, you can do the other. They are equivalent. You, you inherit, uh, of course, also the bad things. Of course, this problem is hard. It's also hard to approximate. But you can use algorithms for price collecting Steiner tree to solve this model, which is what we did in our first version. So recently, we have implemented a new version of our algorithm, which is a dedicated algorithm for this problem. So it, it's based on heavy pre-processing. Then we look at the graph. We make a decomposition of this graph into its uh, bi-connected components and tri-connected components. And we recursively work our way up. And the hard parts, we solve them still with uh, an ILP formulation. And it's also nice to see that this model so looking for modules as price collecting Steiner trees has been picked up by other people. So at this workshop, we have seen in the first day the talk by Ernest Frankel, where they do this. Also, Fabio um, presented his model where he does this, and he showed some very impressive running times. And well, this was a sort of simple scoring function. Uh, but here we have a little bit more complicated scoring function. But again, we see similar things. So if an instance takes five minutes or so to solve, to optimalities, then we consider this a hard instance. So we can really solve large instances of this problem to optimality. And we applied this to a large number of studies, to a large number of omics data. And I want to report about one such um, application, which is a collaboration with the lab of Martina Smith at the FU in Amsterdam. And it's about uh, the human pseudomegalovirus, HCMV, which is a herpes virus. It's very common, so the majority of people is infected. But usually, it's, uh, it's harmless uh, unless the immune system is compromised. And then it can be linked to many diseases, uh, retinitis, hepatitis, and also some cancers. 
And uh, the way the virus works is it expresses four uh, G protein coupled receptor proteins and replaces the host proteins. And by that, it's able to hijack basically the signaling pathways of the cell. So in this study, this was about one of these receptors, US28, and there was uh, mouse cell lines, uh, one uh, expressing US28 and one control cell line, and uh, the data was differential expression. <coughs> so for US28, it is known that this is somehow involved in the beta-catenin uh, signaling pathway and mediates beta-catenin signaling, but it's not clear how. So it was clear that this does not go via the canonical wind pathway, but, uh, well, if not this, then how else? And this was exactly um, what this experiment was about, to find out how this could go. So we complemented this uh, traditional uh, gene expression study by, oops, again, by a network approach. So we applied our model. Uh, we used as network, we used the CAC signaling, signaling and metabolic mouse network, and uh, we computed a, an active module. And I will show you the results in Cytoscape, if it works. Yes, nice. So here we see the background uh, large interaction network. Here we see the module. You cannot really read it. These are the genes with their names. You can see the fold change coded in color, so this is already nice. But our collaborators also wanted to see this module in the context of enriched uh, categories, GO categories, uh, CAC pathways. So we implemented a um, Cytoscape plugin, an app, this is called Examine. And this was together with uh, researchers in visualization from Eindhoven. And here you get a different view of the module. So again, you see a visualization of the module, but you also see the enriched categories. So I chose function and pathway here. And this allowed our collaborators to, for example, pathways in cancer is certainly interesting. Um, so this phosphate signaling pathway is interesting. Then they saw that this pathway in cancer basically uh, can be divided into two functions, growth factor activity, and of course, beta-catenin binding, which they were interested in. So this way you can explore this module, and they could basically um, <clears throat> identify this axis here, which they had previously overlooked, this mat, HDF mat axis. So I can, I can maybe highlight it. Okay, and they focused, uh, focused uh, on this axis and studied it a bit more. And we're able then, based on this, to formulate a new hypothesis, which is basically, so this is the same view, that uh, where is this axis here, um, HDF mat, that US28 upregulates um, HDF. This leads to the activation of this HDF mat axis, and via mat then beta-catenin is released into the cell. And uh, nicely, they made experiments based on this module, and they could validate the first part um, that you see, indeed, uh, elevated uh, HGF levels in US28 uh, induced cells um, in the lab. And so currently we're waiting for, for new data of follow-up experiments and to compute new models for Martina Smith. Okay. Well, so I showed you some simple models for, for some simple combinatorial problems. And um, so in the first talk of this workshop, so Trey Eidecker showed this picture, and uh, we have seen uh, many, many successful methods that, uh, that follow this approach, basically. So integration of many, 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 many different data sources, and then using uh, sophisticated modern machine learning techniques to um, interpret the output and finding many uh, biologically relevant Results. So why is there then still room for these simple methods and simple models I presented? Well, I think um, there, this still makes a lot of sense because in a simple model, you're really close to the entities. So you can really still, simple models are simple, so you can understand what's going on, right? Also, by definition, simple models only have few parameters. And you know that with many parameters, you can basically fit a, a lot of things. So this is also beneficial. And finally, the simple models I showed, so I could use the relation to some well-studied problems. And basically, I see it also as this. So if there's only a handful of, of hard uh, combinatorial problems, and some are easy to solve. And, and if you can identify what makes the problem hard and how you can build a larger problem based on these components, this can be very powerful. And this is also why this can play a big role here. 
because um, simple models make it then possible in some cases to devise exact algorithms. If you have an exact algorithm, you have provably optimal solutions, especially if you combine many, many, many different models and you make uh, errors by heuristic um, optimization. So this will propagate in, in various ways and you don't know anymore what, what you get. So therefore, it's nice to have simple models as building blocks and to solve them exactly. So this concludes my talk. I want to thank uh, my contributors, both uh, in method development, but also for the application studies. In particular, I want to thank um, Markus Dittrich and Tobias Müller from Würzburg, whom I started the Active Modules project with, and we still collaborate, and it's a lot of fun. I also want to um, thank my former PhD student, Mohammed El-Kabir, who contributed a lot to the topics I presented today. I want to thank uh, Brown University and uh, Ben Raphael's group uh, for hosting me currently. I'm doing a sabbatical there. And I want to thank uh, the Fulbright program for partial support. And um, well, here is the tools uh, we implemented. They're all open source. I hope you will use some of them. And thank you for your attention. Okay, very good. good. So this results in terms of topological alignment quality when you compare to LRAL. How did you compare in terms of functional alignment quality and also in terms of running time? Okay, very good questions. Yes. So um, I didn't know it was S cubed, but now I know. So I always say S3. Thanks. So S cubed. Um, so functional evaluation is a bit difficult, I would say, because what you can do, you can, you, can, you can look at the go terms, for example, you find. And what we found, at least uh, at the time, is that all these methods, if you follow the scoring function, they have a way to put the sequence uh, contribution in. And so then you have some alpha times sequence and one minus alpha times uh, topology. And we always found that if we do sequence only, we get the best, uh, we get the best functional uh, scores just because these databases are also built that way. So, um, but we did these comparisons and we compared also, especially in this case, I think for the, for the larger networks where we had so, better as, so much better as cube, we also had much better uh, functional scores. Running time. running time, yes. In this case, I limited the running time to 10 minutes CPU time for both methods. And, and as I said, for, for my method, this was enough to, to converge and I, also, the other method, I think, um, didn't change the results when I, I let it run also for one hour, and it didn't change. For the uh, active modules, uh, this uh, solution actually finds a single model. Yes. a natural way to generalize the formulation to catch multiple modules Yes, there's a way you can do this. You can adapt the integer linear program and find the best uh, K modules. So I, I also implemented this. For the expression data we looked at, it's mostly that for the interesting FDRs, you find one module. And then, of course, if you, if you, um, if you decrease the FDR, this will break down into multiple pieces. Um, but this is the way we look at the modules. We, you, you usually then don't find, so the next best module would be a singleton or something. So this is not so interesting, but there's a way to, um, to also compute multiple modules. I mean, the most easy way is just compute the best one, take it out and do it again. But there's also other ways. We can, can compute the best K at the same time. But it, in the real data, this wasn't really appropriate for some reason. There was always one, always one dominating module for expression data. It will be a follow-up, actually. Uh, so the, the, the formulation depends a lot on that parameter, right? I mean, uh, essentially, as you move that parameter, some of the scores of the nodes are becoming negative. Yes. Uh, so in that sense, wouldn't it make sense to actually look at different values of that parameter and then study the modules, some Indeed. by integrating the modules that you identify with different values of the parameter? Yes, a very good uh, comment. So that's it. 
actually what we do. If we run the method on some real data, we start with a very uh, loose FDR, so you see a very big module. And the way it works with the FDR, this is, as you said, it's just, it just if you, if you decrease the FDR, all the scores get more negative. But this is sort of a linear offset. So you really zoom into, if you lower the FDR, you zoom into the interesting regions of of the module, and therefore it's really just a zooming in. Therefore, aggregating is also not so interesting because it's it's almost always just subset relations. So you can, but that's what we do. We vary this parameter, we start relaxed, and then we zoom into some interesting uh, size. One more question: Can you analytically get a p-value for the module when you do this scoring function? No. So we because it's networks in there. So this is very difficult, I think. I can't. I mean, it's a very interesting question. What we do, of course, is um, we get empirical p-values by running um, on, on randomized networks and uh, then comparing the results. But analytically, it's, I, I can't. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.